Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I was waiting on somebody else to get up here and get things going, and then I was informed they were waiting on me. <laughs> so, uh, can I have pick up just a little bit better? Thank you. Um, we're glad that you're here. I'm Dewey Williams. I'm the pastor here at Mount Bright Missionary Baptist Church. We're glad that you are here. We hope you feel comfortable. We want you to make yourself at home. Uh, kick your shoes off and relax and just enjoy all that's going to be shared. And, and we're glad that you are here. If you need to use the restroom, they're out this door. There's a women's restroom right here. Another one down the hall and men's is down the hall. And uh, so uh, feel free to use the restrooms as needed. Uh, at this time, I think uh, Beverly's going to come and she's going to do what's next. Yes. And, and I think that I step out of the way <laughs> and they'll just carry on. Right. Thank you, Reverend. Mm -hmm. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out on this kind of chilly, wet day. <laughs> we understand that there are many other places you could be, but you chose to come share time with us, and we are mighty grateful for that. I see lots of friendly faces, and I'm learning people, <laughs> and we're just very blessed to have you here. Before I do the introduction, I'm going to... Um, Follow my assigned task and let you know that the Burwell School will happily receive your donation here <laughs> if you have cash. If you'd like to use your card, Miss Emma will receive it there. I think she has a floor. My task this um, afternoon is to introduce our guest speaker. And I'm very honored to have the pleasure of doing so. We met some time ago, I think maybe 2018, and we've um, had a speaking engagement together. And this is a person that I have described as tried, true, and blue North Carolinian with a hand of red. <laughs> Dr. <laughs> Sheila Smith McCoy is a native of Raleigh, North Carolina. She received her Bachelor of Arts in English from North Carolina State University. Her MA in English from the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, that moderate color blue. And her PhD in English at Duke University, that deep color blue. <laughs> Dr. Smith McCoy honored the university, Duke University, that is, by becoming the first African American to end to earn a PhD in English from that fine institution in 1994. Dr. Smith McCoy is published widely in the areas of race and difference, mentorship, literature, and culture. She is a trained mediator. She specializes in restorative justice practices. Look at me, we need you in the board as well. <laughs> and she brings this lens to her ombuds work with colleges and universities. So when she's there dealing with grievances, she's able to apply her skill and come out with a good, just result. result. She also regularly contributes to peacemaking efforts in her community by serving as a voluntary mediator in the San Francisco Bay Area. 
She is a truth and reconciliation discussion leader. Her leadership and skill set are honed by her work in higher education and with nonprofits. And she's done this within the United States as well as abroad. She has served as a consultant with clients in the area of health care, law, social justice, and equity management. Her international engagement work includes creating and sustaining partnerships between higher education institutions in the United States and international universities, as well as non-governmental organizations. And that's not all of who she is. <laughs> she's also an award-winning poet. And I hear she has a new book out. She writes fiction and she's a filmmaker. Her scholarly works have consistently broken new ground in our conversations about race, violence, diversity, equity, inclusion, and access. I am proud to call Dr. Sheila Smith McCoy, my sister, my friend, and my colleague, Dr. Smith McCoy. <laughs> It's so, it's my pleasure to be with you here today. I'm grateful for Mount Bragg Baptist Church. Thank you, Reverend Williams, for hosting us and for the Burwell School Historical uh, Commission. So if you are a commissioner, could you just raise your hand so we can recognize you and thank you for your efforts. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, we're here to talk about Elizabeth Kettner, whose uh, legacy is still something worthy of a wonderful narrative, even now, many decades after she has died. And I'm just privileged to be a part of this work. I want to recognize also Elizabeth Whitman, who founded, you know, publishers. Elizabeth, if you could raise your hand. It's, it's her fault uh, <laughs> that uh, we have two volumes focused on Elizabeth Kenner. This was something that we dreamed of uh, in 2012 and finally came to fruition in 2016 and 2017. She said, Sheila, don't you want to do a volume on Elizabeth Kegley? Oh, sure. And then I send the thing and she said, this is more than one volume. We might not be able to do this, but I'm grateful that we had an opportunity to get both of those books out. And it's all because Elizabeth also believed in the work and life and legacy of Elizabeth Kegley. So let's please give her a round. Of So I'm gonna step out and find this thing out. And Jamar, you could just go with me. Jamar's gonna be the next slide. I also wanted to share this some of my work. Um, one of the things that Judge Reverly did a great job of was saying where I was in the world. Um, those two Kathleen volumes uh, that you see there have been very meaningful in my life uh, because Elizabeth Keckley is one of those um, not one of those narratives that you read who might not always hit home the first time. Um, the narrative is very unusual in that it's not exactly a slave narrative. It was published in 1868, the war had ended. It's not exactly following that format, um, but you can see from what we'll talk about today, and if you were here for the William uh, Bill Andrews lecture, you'll see that this was an extraordinary life. I also want you to notice that I have matched the color of those two books in my outfit. <laughs> Um, I'm also particularly happy about my last two publications, Teaching Literature and Writing in Prisons, and my poetry collection, The Bones for Me. We can move forward now. Let's advance the slide. Is Jamar there? Oh, just that. Um, so I wanted to give you just a little bit of history about her. First, um, we know that she was born in February of 1818. We don't know that because she had the birth certificate. We know that because the person who so-called owned her family, who was also her father, noted it in his journals. Her mother, Agnes Aggie Hobbs, uh, was born in 1786. Her father, Amistad Burwell, is depicted there. 
but she also had a father who was her mother's uh, beloved, um, who she acknowledges in this work, George Clement Hobbs. Now, George was on that plantation, but he was so he was he was in a, a neighboring plantation when they were together, and his so-called master moved to the territories, and it was a real breaking point in Elizabeth Keckley's life. He doted on her. And one of the first things that we see in her narrative is that the mistress of the household asked her mother, why was she carrying on so? It's not as if he was anything special. In other words, he was just a slave to leave. What we also want you to know about these, this, this family is that they were literate. Now, as many of you know, it was illegal to teach people who were enslaved to read, but Keckley was literate. Her mother was literate. We have uh, a letter represented from her um, slave father, George, who had written her a letter. And we also have other mementos of this life. So that's one thing I want you to be aware of because one of the crucial complex things about the Keckley narrative is that so many people tried to prove for so many years up until uh, 1936, now she died in 1907, that she didn't actually write this narrative. So it's important for you to know that she's a, at least a second generational literate person. This is unusual and it's a point of history that we haven't talked as much about that I would love for us to. Uh, at the age of 14, as was the custom, when a family member got married, they were often gifted enslaved people and she went with her brother, Robert, and eventually Robert and his wife um, came to Hillsboro and they founded a school that became the rural school um, that the historic site is here, 1835. She was actually in Hillsborough for about seven years. Um, we're gonna move forward just a little bit here. She was the only person who was their servant. Um, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. Could you speak up a bit? Sure, is this better? Okay. Um, she actually was the only person who was serving in a servant capacity in that household, even while the school was there. So it's important to know that this, this was a difficult job for her while she was there. Um, the Burwells um, were friends and neighbors with William Bingham. William Bingham was a school teacher. He was known for being particularly cool. And Kegley was known for being particularly imprudent. Um, she worked very hard and she didn't mind telling people. Um, and one of the things that was a strife in that family was that Anna had a very fraught relationship with Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth was beautiful. She also was creative. Anna did not see herself in the same light. And one of her, her desires is, was, was that Keckley would not be imprudent. And so they decided to have uh, this neighbor, Mr. Bingham, beat her. If you've not read the narrative, it's written in such a way that's almost harrowing. Um, one of the things he asked her to do as he she is putting his infant to bed is to take down your dress so that I can beat you. Um, let me give a show of hands for how many people have actually read the narrative. So everybody's here. Uh, and she refuses. She says, you have no right to beat me. And if you do beat me, it's because you bested me. Uh, and they, they decide they fight. He ends up besting her that day um, and beat her brutally. Now, this is also different from the tradition of the slave narrative as we know it. If you're familiar with many slave narratives, there are references to brutal beatings, not always with women involved. And most of the time, the women do not fight back. Kathleen not only fought back this time, she fought back every single time she was affronted with this kind of violence. This is the kind of thing that you see happening in male slave narratives. So if you're familiar with the narrative of life of Frederick Douglass, one of the things he talks about is this major battle. This is the moment at which he becomes a free man after he bests this man in this battle. So the fact that Elizabeth Keckley is doing this, we're gonna come back to later because she really is confronting some narratives that we were, take, were taken to be true, and she's living in, in a different way. The school is founded, um, and um, in 1836 is when this first meeting happened with Bingham. You should know, if you haven't, if you have read the narrative, you will, if you haven't read the narrative, um, he beat her again. The, the next time he got better ropes, they fought again. But when she did not succumb, she never gave up her fight, even though she was bested. And those of you who read the narrative know that he was moved to the fact that he said he would never touch her again. The strife between Anna and um, Elizabeth continued. And so the next culprit was her brother, Robert. 
I believe that Robert knew that he was her half brother, which is one of the reasons why there is no evidence of any sexual assault going on in that household. I will give him much credit for that. However, he also took up the mantle to beat her. Um, she wanted to know what was going on. She demanded to know why she was beaten. He beat her with an oak stick. Um, and he, although he was encouraged in these beatings by his wife, when she saw her bloody, when she saw Elizabeth bloody, and I think still with that fighting spirit, she begged him not to beat her again. That was not the end of her troubles. By 1838, uh, she was being raped by um, Mr. Kirkland, Alexander Kirkland. Um, you should know that he was of a different social hierarchy. He was higher in the social, social art hierarchy than were the Burwells. If Robert had wanted to do anything about it, it would have been impossible. On the other hand, because she was enslaved, any children born of that union, if one would call it that, would be increasing his property. Um, one of the things you should also know about Alexander Kirkland is that he was six foot eight and quite heavy. There was no way she could have defended herself. And if you look at the date, she was still late in her teens when these assaults were happening. This went on, it actually started when his, his wife was pregnant with their second child, when he started uh, raping Keckley. The child born of this union, George, was much beloved by Keckley. And he will figure um, not only later in her life, in the form of her life, but even after his death, it becomes an interesting figure, and I'll get to that. She was sent back to Virginia with this child when he was a few months old. And within a few months after that, Kirkland had uh, died. And so um, that might be payback. Was that the payback from the universe? I like to think so. Let's move to Eventually, she gets gifted to her sister, Anne, um, who married an attorney named Hugh Garland. Garland was quite an interesting character in the sense that um, he was supposed to be a successful lawyer. He never really was. He wanted to be a writer. He was never really successful at that. He did have an awesome library, though, that was actually valued at about $600 at the time of his death. They moved to St. Louis, uh, where you can imagine what St. Louis was like, quite a different style of life than in Virginia and then in Hillsboro. And in, in St. Louis becomes a formative year for her. What you might want to know about Hugh Garland is that um, he was defending the so-called owners of Dredd and Harriet um, Scott. So when Dredd and Harriet Scott sued for their freedom, he and another, his partner, were the attorneys of that couple. We can move forward to more. This is a picture of Kathleen, the oldest picture that we have in terms of her appearance. Um, and the other thing you should know about her, which is unique to her, and um, whether male or female slave narratives, is that she paid for her own freedom. So $1,200 in today's value to Margo, one more time, $42,540.28. Now, St. Louis was also unusual for her. Again, she finds herself in a household where she becomes the primary provider. Um, the Garlands wanted to put her mother, Aggie, out to work. She was quite old. And Elizabeth said, please don't, I will work. And so what she writes in the narrative is that with the, she sewed for 17 people, she fed 17 souls with the fruits of her labors. Now her talent lay in the fact that she was a Mantua maker. Um, in fact, we find her listed on the free, uh, free black rolls in St. Louis, several years later after she purchased her freedom as a Mantua maker. Everybody here know what a Mantua is? So um, we'll come across a picture of Keckley a little bit later uh, with something that's akin to that. So it's a fitted bodice, and then the hoop skirt is made out of whalebone and metal and fitted with fabric. Very few people could do this, and you'll see as we go through the slide deck some of Keckley's creations that are still extant. She became talented at doing this, which uh, is another reason why she is remembered today, and I think that her feet. I'll say a little bit more about St. Louis while she was there. She purchased her own freedom at a time when Garland was encouraging her to run away. This was around 1850. What is the significance of that 1850 day? 
everybody raise their hands. You see, um, the Fugitive Slave Act was passed, which met, which gave anyone the power to reclaim a person who they thought could be a slave, a former runaway slave, and return them to their so-called owners. Many free people were taken into captivity during this time, and it was a very dangerous time for anyone to quote escape slavery. He kept telling you, you could just go across the river. But because she was literate, she understood the law and she said she refused to do that. Then Garland died, Hugh Garland died. And one of the things that the widow said, if you can bring me six men to, to swear that you can you will come back, then I will let you go off to New York and you can raise money for your fee. By then though, because she had had what would have been a misfortune of sewing and supporting that entire household, she had many clients who were very satisfied with her work. They told her, why go to New York when we can loan you to me? So she took the money, but she refused to leave until she had paid it all back. And she had paid it all back within a very short period of time. This kind of gives you the just a, a keen insight into how industrious and hardworking this person was. She continued to do whatever she could. Now we're gonna talk about George a little bit. George, um, was freed with his mother. The manumission statement describes him as near white. Now we'll think about this. Keckley's father was white. His father was white. We can have a long conversation about what white means um, maybe later after this in the Q&A, Q but he was visibly white. This was not unusual. There were many people who could have been visu visibly white. There still are. There was just no category of biracial. You were black, mulatto, or whatever color you were determined to be. You could be a bright mulatto. You could be a mulatto mulatto. You could be whatever you just weren't white. In much of our country's history, as I will argue is true today, white means not something else. Again, that's a conversation for another time. George, um, she left Georgia Wilberforce. Wilberforce University and HBCU founded to give education to many newly freed people. She ensconced him in Wilberforce. I will also add that he worked during the time that his mother was trying to repay that debt and was able to, on his own accord, contribute about $100 according to uh, the, what the records say. She left him safely in Wilberforce and she traveled first to Baltimore and then to DC to open up her own business. During this time, free black people had difficulty living in cities not because they didn't want to live in cities, but because it, as you see, that was a part of the segregation pattern. One had to have a license often to even live in a city. One of the things that Kathleen was able to do because of her creative talent was that she had a, a whole lot of people for whom she was sewing. She was not only sewing for uh, senators, she was sewing for both sides of the Civil War divide. Mm -hmm. She was sewing for Verena Davis at the same time she was sewing for Mary Todd Lincoln. She wanted to meet Mrs. Lincoln, and eventually, as Mrs. Lincoln was inviting seamstresses up to see who she would try, she meets Keckley. So we're going to come back to this. She meets Keckley in 1861. Um, that's a little bit um, fudge that when their relationship actually came into being. And unbeknownst to Keckley, George had left Wilberforce University, and he had enlisted in the Army to fight in the Civil War. He had enlisted in the army as a white man. That's the only way he could have seen battle because Negroes were only allowed to be in the servant corps. He enlisted as a white man and he died in the second big battle of the Civil War in Missouri, Wilson Creek, the Battle of Wilson Creek, uh, Missouri. I believe there were about 20,000 casualties in that one battle. It was a significant loss for the Union Army. This will come back later, so put a pin in the fact that George is there. Now, we know that Mrs. Lincoln, as Keckley said, um, uh, she, was, she, was a, she was not a well-proportioned woman. And so it was very difficult to sew for her. Um, but she was very happy with the ball gown that Mrs. Keckley had made for her. I, I want to go back to 1850 for just a second. Up until 1850, she was Elizabeth Hobbs. She married a man who claimed to be uh, a free man, who had followed her from Virginia to St. Louis, took his last name, um, but they didn't stay together very long. She said, quote, he was dissipated. 
and she had no further use for him. So when she moved uh, to DC, Baltimore, she was literally a free woman in every sense of the word. Um, George is killed in the Battle of Wilson's Creek, as I said. Um, and we know that Mrs. Lincoln had a very difficult losses of her own shortly thereafter. Um, the first child died in the White House um, before Lincoln died. Keckley was one of the few people who was at that baby's bedside when he passed. One of the other things that you should know, they were not only bound by that, that common loss of a child, but both of them are very interested in the spiritualist movement. This is something that needs to be further investigated. Um, but the spiritualist movement was that movement where there was a lot of interest in mediums and seances, in uh, table knocking, in, in ghost writing, and both of them were aligned with that movement. Um, and there were many people who were around with that movement whose names that you would know. Sojourner Truth moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, not because she wanted to go to Michigan, but because it was a spiritualist community. There's some indication that Harry Jacobs may have been peripheral to that movement. We don't, that's another area that I would love to read. She knew Harry Jacobs very well. She also knew um, many of the people that you're familiar with. Fred Douglas was a personal friend of hers as well. And so there were seances at the Lincoln White House. How many of you didn't know that? There are pictures of the seances at the Lincoln White House. They were not the first to have seances, but they were the ones who had the most seances. So one might imagine they were trying to really connect with those lost sons that they had that had left them before. Um, the other thing that will be important about this is that Keckley was making enough money that she founded the Contraband Relief Association. Now, escaped and formerly enslaved people were defined as contraband. Um, talk about being defined as an object. Um, they were called contraband. But she founded this organization to help the many people who were coming north with nothing. Um, this became really a prudent move on her behalf. The other thing that she did was to make sure that she carefully indexed who donated to that. The Lincolns donated to that, Frederick Douglass's, Douglass donated to that. She made a significant contribution to the Contraband Society. At the time that she was at the height of her dressmaking business, she employed about 20 women, other black women who she was training to be creators like she was. Now she didn't call herself a dressmaker, she called herself a modiste. She was the designer and the creator of this work. Um, Lincoln is assassinated in 1865. It was Mrs. Lincoln who wanted Keckley to be at the White House during that time. And later she would give Keckley uh, the very cape uh, that Lincoln was wearing when he was assassinated. Now, the other important thing to know is uh, Mary Todd Lincoln was not popular. She spent an awful lot of money refurbishing the White House. She was, she was thousands of dollars over what was allotted for that during the time that Keckley was working with her. As the first black paid employee of the White House, Keckley sewed a lot for Mrs. Lincoln. And part of, I will argue, um, of the, the pushback against Keckley also had to do with the debt that Mrs. Lincoln was in. Um, when the president was assassinated, it took Congress a long time to even give Mary Todd Lincoln a pension. She was basically penniless. Um, we know from her response to the death of her son that it wasn't going to go well with the death of Lincoln. She was expected to carry this loss as stoically as possible. But what happened instead was that she was actually human. But the whole time she was threatened, even by her son, Robert, that he would put her in a lunatic's uh, um, uh, asylum if she didn't behave. This is the same thing that happened when her, her young son died. She was threatened that she would be put away if she didn't stop being so crazy in her grief. Um, and so Mrs. Lincoln was in a very unusual situation as well. We'll talk a little bit more through those things as we go through these things. Um, she needed money and Keckley had loaned her money. In addition, she receives a letter from Mrs. Lincoln in 1867 saying that she's going to sell some of her old clothes and that she's going to go to Chicago. She cannot live off of the $1,700 that she now has a month. Um, and she's going to go to New York from Chicago to sell these clothes. It did not go well. 
Um, when it came out that it was Mary Todd Lincoln's clothes, there was a huge scandal, the sale was halted, and then she was charged money for even having the clothes there to even get them back. Keckley had to drop what she was doing and go accompany Miss Lincoln to see through that. So she writes behind the scenes in 1868, and she talks about the fact that much is being said publicly about Mrs. Lincoln that she doesn't appreciate. We need the whole story. She says she was writing for more than one reason, not just to tell her life story, but also to, in some way, bring some redemption to the reputation of Mary Todd. Um, there's much ink spilled on the fact that the book comes out, immediately there's pushback. Uh, there's an article published that it was written by Bitsy Keckley and signed with an X, uh, a Negro slave, an illiterate Negro slave who wrote a book. Um, then the talk was that abolitionists had written this book. Never was it even imagined that, that Elizabeth Catley wrote this book. Indeed, it got so bad that people even questioned that Catley herself existed. Uh, luckily for us, there are other records that suggest otherwise. Um, there's Mrs. Lincoln stopped speaking to her. We do not know the backstory there. Certainly she was embarrassed by all the pushback and we'll talk a little bit more about that. But the other side of it is that Lincoln herself was a bit powerless. She depended on other people for everything she got. She had to have the goodwill of the white people around her. There was no other, she wasn't gonna be able to get a job. There was nothing else she could do. Keckley, on the other hand, had other things to do. A lot has been said about the fact that Keckley um, despaired her entire life that Mrs. Lincoln never spoke to her again. But I'm gonna put this question to you. She had been enslaved. She had lost her business. She had lost her child. The loss of Mrs. Lincoln was not going to kill Elizabeth Keckley. Her life continued. We do have evidence of that. Uh, in 1893, at the time she had got taken a job also over dressmaking at a university. Um, and there's not much that we can find in the extant record about this, but at that infamous World Fair, uh, where uh, people were exhibited like uh, animals in cages, Elizabeth Keckley did the dress exhibit at the Chicago World Fair. We know that she continued in her life. One more. And then she dies in 1907 of a stroke while she was living at the destitute, the home for destitute women and children in DC, which was operated by the very foundation that she had found, the Contraband Society. So full circle. So I talked a little bit about Harry Jacobs, let's go for Jamar. Um, and um, Harry Jacobs and Elizabeth Keckley actually went to the same church. They were eulogized by the same man, Francis Grimke, who has a very unusual racial story of his own. He and his brother were born in South Carolina, uh, the children of a famous uh, attorney and senator um, who told his white children, his white son, that these two boys, um, he and his brother should be protected after his death. Instead, he brutalized them. Um, and by accident, their aunts, their white aunts who were abolitionists found them and contributed to their education. Grimby became the pastor of a Presbyterian church, a black Presbyterian church in the DC area where many prominent people uh, came to church and Keckley and Harry Jacobs were two of them. He really got to both of them. So I wanted to put up Chimamanda Gigi's um, story here about the danger of a single story. It's because there isn't a single story about Elizabeth Keckley, but the masculine machine of white patriarchy wanted you to believe just a single story. So let's untangle just how complicated her story is. Let's move forward, Chima. This is how she starts behind the scenes. I've often been asked to write my life as those who know me know that it has been an eventful one, I'll say, right? <laughs> uh, what's interesting about this is that she says that there are many things that has happened, uh, but nothing has been necessarily exaggerated, uh, but these incidents make up a history. And her life really does reveal a lot about United States history at the time of her life and at the time of her death. I put there the front place space of the, of the original uh, publication in 1868. Let's look forward to more. So there are lots of narratives uh, competing 
in Elizabeth Cantley's life. And we're gonna go through them one by one. Um, white patriarchy, the cult of white womanhood, the idea of race itself, um, the ways in which people are placed in the world. And so we're gonna go through a, a few of these at a time to see if we can really unpack how her history reflects in the United States history, not only in her time, but of our time too. We're still living through some of these conversations. Let's move forward. So white patriarchy and the cult of white womanhood. Let's pop them all up here, Jamaka Wood. I had put here um, one of the outfits that she designed that is still extant. Um, let's go back here. Um, and the cult of white womanhood uh, is very interesting. It's a cult of domesticity, that the place of the woman is in the home. The place of the woman is certainly uh, subservient to that of the man. And it's important that you understand this was about white womanhood. Women aren't supposed to work out of the home, all these things. Now, the entire time that the cult of white womanhood, this cult of domesticity was going on, Black and Indigenous and Brown women were working outside. So many of you have come through women's studies courses saying that women didn't work outside the home until the explosion in the 1960s. Well, that's a very small segment of women. Black, brown, and indigenous women have always worked outside of the home. This puts Keckley in a position of a little bit more agency than Mary Todd Lincoln, who had been raised to be in this very small space where she was subservient, had no voice, had no place except where men allowed it. Keckley defied those women. Also, white patriarchy is important here. Again, there's a, a, a movement where the, the men are over where the women and control all of life. We, talk, we know of at least two incidents where Keckley fought back, not like a man, but like a woman who's determined to embrace her own personhood. But that defied the cult of, of, of white patriarchy as well. So she fought back, she paid for her freedom. She was a business owner. And I'm saying not only was she a businesswoman, she was teaching other women how to have their own businesses as well uh, before her, her company stopped as she was defending Mrs. Lincoln. Second generation literate, she was a divorced woman. You don't hear very much about divorce during this time, uh, but she left the dissipated Mrs. Ke Mr. Kepler behind and continued her life. And she defied all of the mores that were in place, not only in this work, but also in her spiritual freedom to believe that she could connect with, with others outside of this life and to go through that life. Now she moved forward. Now, Black women being the meal of the world is a famous quote from Zora Neale Hurston's work, um, one of her first works. Um, I wanted to put that up there because the idea of being servile and beneath is all a part of that. And there's supposed to be a difference between men's work and women's work. Um, Kately offered the five this. Uh, this is this famous strawberry gown that she created for Mrs. Lincoln that is still in the Smithsonian. And this quilt that is on this uh, particular slide is said to be made up of the scraps of the fabric left over from many of the dresses that she made for Mrs. Lincoln. And I believe that one is held at Kent State. I'll correct me if that's wrong. She refused to be survived. <clears throat> One of the things I didn't tell you in her free papers, um, Anne says she is known as, um, as Garland's Lizzie. She wasn't Garland's Lizzie. She was Elizabeth Keckley. She reclaimed her name. Um, I told you before that her son entered the Union Army as a white man, which meant that he had a, a rather significant pension. She was able to get that pension. And the reason why she was able to get that pension, somehow she was elevated to white status for just that moment. And so even though she needed money, she was supported for the rest of her life on the money uh, based on the of her son's sacrifice for her. He demonstrated agency at every turn, and she also leveraged white friendships. I told you that you had to have a license to be a free person working in a space. When she moved to DC, she did not have a license. She was able to talk to one of her friends who knew the mayor and she was granted a license for free. These are important things to know. Mrs. Um, Lincoln um, came to her, to Keckley's um, space twice. And each time she came to Keckley's space, it was a bit of a violation 
Kathleen preferred that she go to the White House or to the client to work. And every time Mrs. Lincoln came to the space, Keckley got something out of it. One of those times she got an audience to uh, and, uh, hit the inauguration for her and someone else. The legal acumen she just demonstrated not only in not escaping so that she could be taken back into enslavement, but also to have the presence of mind to apply for the sun extension as a, as a white woman. And she trained other black women to find these divides. It's important to note that although she is not touted as a leader, she was definitely a leader in many of the things that she did. Let's move forward, Jamar. Here are two other uh, things. The one on the right is at the Smithsonian. I'm very aware of that. Um, and so the fact that if you ever go to the museum, you'll actually be able to touch a Catholic creation is, is necessary. The lost cause and racial violence and racist being. We are still uh, trying to figure out race in this country. And when we talk about going back to the way things used to be, it was still a quagmire and a mess. We still have not defined these things well. I say this often, and I'm gonna say it again today. If you are human, please raise your hand. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Raise your hands high. Is there anybody who did not raise their hand? Okay, everybody, all the humans, put your hands down. Um, is there anybody who's not a human? <laughs> if you are human, human life started in Africa. And so the idea of race is a power play. It's a hierarchy play aimed at maintaining power. It has not worked very well for many of us. It certainly has not worked very well for women. Keckley was living in that quiet mind, and she continued to live in that quiet mind. The one interesting thing, and something that actually when I was in graduate school reading this narrative for the first time was something that I was taking back a bit. She talked about her black and white family and loving them equally. She even describes visits to the white uh, part of her family who were people who claimed to own her, the children that she helped to raise. When Kegley was just four years old, her first job was to take care of the baby. And she's four years old, how many of you would give a baby to a four-year-old? She was expected to keep the flies out of its face and to keep the baby raw so it wouldn't cry. Unfortunately, the baby came out and she thought that she should just use the, um, the fireplace shovel to get it back in place. That was her, face, her first feeding. But you put a four-year-old in charge of the baby. Uh, the expectation was unreal. Um, but what we see here is that she was able to love these people. And she included that in her narrative. She loved the Lincolns, not just Mrs. Lincoln, but President Lincoln. When Richmond fell, this is remembered in the, in the book, she was able to walk into the state house where black people have been to be going in Virginia and to step where she was in, days before it would have been illegal for her to be there. Um, she claimed that space. She had the nerve to have joy and entrepreneurship and to live a life outside of the domestic space. She never married again. We don't know if she had loves in her life, but we do know from description from Frances Grimkey, Grimke, her pastor and eulogist, that she was happy and a possessed person, despite the fact that people claim that the divide of losing Mrs. Lincoln ruined her life. She ignored those North-South divides. I'll go back to this. Um, there was a statue of Robert E. Lee that was created um, when the Union won. And um, she went to see the statue. And what he was wearing was a gown that she had, she had sewed in his wife, um, which is also funny in its own right, um, that Robert E. Lee would be captured wearing a gown that it would be happy to buy. She, in fact, defied every stereotype assigned to her and continued to do so. Let's move forward, Jamar. Um, this is her uh, grave site now. Uh, it was moved to the site many decades after her death. Um, she died in 1907. Uh, she had been working still at the university teaching, had a stroke that made, rendered her unable to sew anymore. And for a while she lived as a boarder, um, but she died of a stroke in 1907. Um, the eulogy that Grimke wrote for her talked about her beautiful, vibrant spirit, how she always had a smile on her face, how, of course, she was also well-dressed. Um, but I want to put a pin in something. Um, as late as 1936, 
an article came out in the Minnesota Journal of History claiming that Kelly didn't write that book, mm -hmm. that Jane Swinson wrote that book, who was an abolitionist writer, a contemporary of Kelly's. I mean, there's no evidence that they met each other. But the letters that were exchanged between Francis Grimke and the person trying to find out clearly thought that Keckley didn't write the book, that she didn't exist. So even in 1936, decades after she died, there's still people trying to erase her, uh, but she's a little bit immortal and they haven't been able to do so. Uh, because of that, and because of the fact that the girl was, was here, she will always be remembered. Uh, I want to pause for a minute for questions, but before I do, I want to read a poem. I am too young for my focus. <laughs> uh, that I wrote about with this Kelly. Actually, just after we presented Judge Beckham, called Ever After. I've spoken to you from the eaves while the sunset casts amber and shadows on the roof of the porch. I like the dark design of paint on the window cases with its dying light as it streaked the parlor. The walls were once flatter in my blood. You must suspect that it is me chanting in the attic while you work below, just above your head. I plan pretty disruptions to silence your version of my life, but no ghost can quite quiet me. My name echoes through every word. I dance through time across the floors that you polish. I pause to whisper like the wind. Do you hear the rustling of my mantua, a gown of my own design, as we pass the stairs? Admit it, I am eternal, a wise light against the goodness. Um, if you haven't visited Peru School, please do so. You do feel her presence there. Um, and there is literally a feeling when you walk into that place that there's a living history, a living history that you can experience, that you can identify with and relate to, and that some people say this Kathleen is still a part of. So thank you for your time today, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Any questions? Yes. I have um, more of a comment, I guess it would be a question as well, but I think I remember reading about things that your eventually took his father's name at her place when he went into the military. So that's even more profound that Kathleen had the last name Kathleen and claimed the pension for her. Okay. <laughs> um, the magic of America, for sure. Um, and and he was actually the name that was spurred by yeah. the report. Uh, any other questions? I'm going to unseat that from rural school. I'll take questions for you, but okay. if you have not, raise your hand. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, I don't even know how to sound like watching the movie, um, listening to the, um, the layers and the detail and the uh, amount of information and the way that you bring it for, for us. and. Um, for her spirit, you know, and how important that is to have, you know, people who are just passing the legacy along and giving it to us as breath so that we can have that in our lives and not for one moment to uh, let her legacy go by. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dylan. Um, and I'll, but that reminds me, um, she was so much her own person that unlike other slave narrators, again, her narrative is, is was published in 1868, so wars ended. So not quite a slave narrative, but follows those conventions. Every slave narrative that has been published had a white authenticator. A white person had to say, this person wrote this, I'm well acquainted with this person. Um, even going back to Phyllis Wheatley, where she had to have 12 people, 12 white men say, that she wrote this work, Kegley authenticated himself. Um, and speaking of the movie, uh, my friend um, uh, Gabby Fulton Ponder and I are trying to work now on a movie or a script project that we hope will come to fruition one day. But it is the stuff that movies are made of. Certainly it is. So thanks for saying that. So it's through the burn rails. 
from from Hillsborough that her information is seen or or a lot here in, in Hillsborough. So when you came to the church, you turned at Burwell School. Right. That's the side of the school and where she was enslaved for seven years. Uh, um, as a, And that family originated in Virginia. Um, and then Keckley's uh, spent, as you know, that circuitous route up to DC. But the book is available. Uh, Eno Publishers has a version. It's also available online. It's also held by um, UNC in its Southern Historical Collection as well. We'll be selling it today as well, if you're interested. Oh, thank you. It was a question back then. Yes, um, she does mention it in her narrative. We do know that she had several, um, well, let me let me put a pin in that. She had several items of the deceased President Lincoln's um, personal belongings, a hairbrush, that cloak, some gloves, the hat that she eventually sold um, years later. We don't know exactly how much she got, um, but she sold it at a time, again, when her business had closed and she was unable to work. Uh, but there is evidence that she was actually called um, to the space, that he had great faith in her, that he talked to her. We know that um, she was able to get um, an audience. She had the glove that he used at his inauguration um, that he gifted to her. And we do know that he greeted her readily during those times that she was present there during the morning of Tad Lincoln. So even outside of the, in the narrative, there is discussion of it, but even outside the narrative, there is evidence of that. I am um, for and I work now on the research, and you have a problem, and you are in the profession, so I would like your opinion. But you would say that you would like to be done. Okay. <laughs> well, we, some of us, would like very much to add a person who can't explain to the land of the people who are school. So I'm going to see the only time to start a convention. And it was called the Burwell School in all of the university. And had been past like 60 years. But uh, the work and the education talked about the areas of education. So I had to play about these things. Records are not there. And I searched for them. And the records are the dress that she made, and the photographs. So that might be the speed of uh, struggling for a name. Well, wouldn't it be great if Elizabeth Keckley's name was on there? Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why. Um, outside of the environs of Hillsboro, the Burwell School is not well known. Outside of the environs of Hillsboro, Elizabeth Keckley is immortal. And so the, the site as a school can benefit from being connected with that name in more ways than just the site living on the Burwells school reputation alone. Not that educating young women wasn't a wonderful thing, not that the Burwells didn't do good in the world, but it's the Elizabeth Keckley presence that brings people here more often than not. Uh, but this is North Carolina at a particular time in our history. Um, and so I would also say that um, part of what needs to happen now is a real push to make sure that Elizabeth Keckley becomes a part of the curriculum of every school in North Carolina. It's a part of our history. We often hear more about Harry Jacobs, mm -hmm. whose life doesn't, is a wonderful, fulfilled life. But Jacobs hid for seven years in an attic before she was able to get to the safety of someone else bringing her to freedom. Elizabeth Catholic's story is a true American story, mm -hmm. the America that we all pride ourselves as being a part of. And so um, if there's anything I can do to help with that, I'd certainly say it, but the legacy of the Burwell School will live longer and brighter than uh, it does now with Elizabeth Keckley's name attached to it. That might be why she's haunting it. Let me just do that. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mm 
Let me be like Elizabeth Kathleen Habner here. Um, and I'll say it all equates to race. As long as you believe that race is in this pot and never touches this pot, even though we have all these evidence to the contrary, who would give their infant to an animal to nurse? Who would give their infant to an animal to take care of? Who would have a relationship, sexual relationship, consensual or otherwise with an animal that bears children and say that they are not human? Who would see uh, that you bleed just like I bleed and say that this is not so? And so my answer to that, sir, is that if you um, hide that long enough, you can keep the roots of race going. Every day, I am thankful for DNA um, surveys. And I'll tell you why. Um, at first, I was very upset to have my DNA out in the public space. But as a person who in this body is Black, some of my history was hidden. And I was never going to be able to find it. And all of my life, I knew that we had Native blood. And I would have been uh, ashamed at one point in my life to, to know that I had blood that was European. But alas, I do, like every Black person in this country. And alas, every white person in this country has some measure of other blood as well. After all, what is this blood quantum that we're talking about? Everyday people who think they're white discover that they have an ancestor who wasn't. And so it's very um, lucrative. Race has been lucrative for those who make money off of it every day. And as long as you can keep the roost going, the better off you are. The reason why I think this hard pushes on this generation is uh, and on higher education, the assault on higher education, the assault on black and brown women in higher education is all because people who are educated know more and vote different. And so race has always been a power play and keeping this history a secret and buried is a part of that narrative, but it can only free us to know the truth. Uh, I found out last year that I had a relative that I would never know who fought in the Revolutionary War. I never knew that. Um, and so the more we know about a history, the more it really opens up possibility for all, instead of possibility for the people who are making money off of the manufacturing place. So hopefully Elizabeth Keckley can be a part of the curriculum. And thank you very much for what you went through to integrate schools in this area. I have a few questions from the Zoom chat. Sure. Um, I, I'm loud. Are they laughing about me? Not <laughs> I don't yeah. think so. Okay. Um, so the first question that I see is, is there a collection of Elizabeth Keckley's personal papers? If so, where is that collection housed and is it accessible to the public? No collection of her personal papers, although uh, there is evidence that she wrote letters mm -hmm. uh, that are in other collections. More work needs to be done to actually define where those letters are. Um, but what we have exit, the best thing we have exit right now is the narrative. Wonderful. And then the other question in the chat is, when did Keckley find out that her son George had joined the Union Army? Was it after he had enlisted and did he keep it a secret from her? You know, I would imagine he kept it a secret, but it's all when I write the story, mm -hmm. uh, she finds out quite by accident. Um, but one of the things that people depended on uh, during this era was that newspapers would actually publish who was going where in the war. So she may very well have found out that her son was, in, if he didn't tell her, we don't know. We very, she might have found out that this regiment is comprised of these people and they're going here at this time. I hope that he told her, my hope is that he told her, but we don't know. She clearly had other plans for him when she left him at World Force than for him to die on the battlefield. 
I have a, an only son. And if he hadn't told me something like that, I might kill him anyway. <laughs> Bring that. <back. laughs> yeah. Take my Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, and about her life here in Hillsborough. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, did she talk about the social life? Did she? Mm -hmm. I'm curious to know, did she stub and generate any of the girls? You know, was it the girl? What were some of her, um, I guess, uh, responsibilities as an employee person? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. We don't know if she sold, if, if the um, things that she created made money for the girls. What we do know is that she had a very active and vibrant social life because in one year she was invited to be a maid of honor for five or six uh, women in the community. Um, so she had a very vibrant social life, which also contributed to the strife between Elizabeth and Anna, who did not have a vibrant social life. After all, she was married to a minister, she was the school mistress, and she was married. And Keckley had freedom in some ways that she did not. Um, one would assume that because uh, people had to pay for their children to come to the school, that they had money. And she very likely sold for some of the women in the school, the girls in the school. Uh, but we know that she would have created something awesome for those weddings that she went to. Um, and maid of honor um, exists as a term because many times, um, the so-called popular enslaved women who looked a certain way would be invited to be in a wedding. So if you're not married yet, yeah, you might want to consider not having made a lot just to honor that history. Yeah. I think Keckley was really the epitome of a free woman. Um, and she was able to invent herself. She had money to support herself. And she was brave enough to fight even when there was no chance of her winning until she won. So. Thank you, Rick uh, We asked about writing. I know there is a garment that she has done at her school. You mentioned that she fits on and other. How many of her? garments that she created do we know that are still out there mm -hmm. that people can go and see the work that she's done. I and then the second that. question is, how did you become drawn into her story? Oh, thank you, Reverend Weeds. I think there are five or six of those garments still about, and the one at the Verbal School is a, is a replica, correct? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the ones held by the Smithsonian, and for a while, Kent State had some of her things. I believe Kent State is where this quilt is. I, I will be corrected if that's not true. Um, so that's where that quilt is. Um, but the other thing that we have to think about is uh, after she left Wilbur Forest, she was sort of, she moved from place to place. Um, and having moved five times in the last uh, four years, you don't keep everything <laughs> all with you, right? Her sewing kit, there's a picture of her sewing kit that is available uh, where she had to find needles in a velvet case. Um, so some of those things are still extant, but we, we, there's no way that we would have everything. The fact that we have anything mm -hmm. really blew mm -hmm. our way. It's a long time for that. And it also speaks to um, her craft. There are articles written about her design, even now, as being unique and, and creative in ways that make those garments last. And I became attracted to her because how could I not be? Right. <laughs> um, so here's a story much different from any other uh, thing written by a Black woman at that time. Um, there's no apology in it. If you ever read Harriet Jacobs' Incident in the Life of a Slave Child, Slave Girl, one of the things that she is castigated by by her grandmother is that she would have children out of wedlock. And how crazy is that? She's enslaved. Her mother had children out of wedlock as a slave woman. Her grandmother had children. So this is someone else's writing on, on what this moral of this story is. Kegley's story is purely her own. There's no other one like it. Um, and what she survived and what she continued to do in the face of all, all the things that happened to her. That she loved this child dearly, even though he was a product of rape. And again, that she had the capacity to 
really love the people who once held her in bondage with all of their faults, to, to love the children that she was asked to, to watch, and to see them as a free person on her own terms. She traveled by herself at a time when most women did not, and certainly white women did not, which is why she had to go to Mrs. Lincoln's aid in New York to begin with. Um, that's a story to, to pass on. So I'm thankful for that, and thankful again for Elizabeth for uh, bringing out those two volumes. Thanks for your questions. Other questions? Well, we've got books. Uh, yes, Steve, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I just want to make a couple of comments. And I'll say uh, 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 a comment being asked about social life and, and, and what kind of life she had in those books. The uh, research committee for well published in 2019 um, a, a, a a work called Annabelle and Phillips Girl, Free of Color, <laughs> and Slave at Broomwell School. And certainly, uh, the, the, the lust of that slave community, slave community at Burwell and surrounding in the town, would have been a part of that community. So, some of those things would, would be very familiar with the Catholic Catholic and a costume part of her uh, African American. Um, of color um, family, and we invite that. We do talk to what we have for a while on the machine plug. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Dr. I remember you shared with us in 2018 or 19. Yeah, and that was so, such a wonderful time to do a bicentennial in 2018 of um, Captain Pearl for the 200 years. and, and we have Jennifer Blusher here, who's written, I think, the only real biography from it some time ago. And I guess my, my question to you was I'm very excited that you're thinking about screenplay. And I asked Phil, do you know if anyone's working on an update or an expanded biography work from the silver point of view? It seems to be so much information um, about it. Uh, do you know if anyone's working on it? I, it's a topic seems to scream for a, an author, a buyer, an updated biography. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, Pleister did such an absolutely fantastic job. It's mm -hmm. going to be hard to top. Uh, I, one of my disappointments about the two collections is that we wanted uh, one of Pleister's chapters in it, and we couldn't get permission from the publisher, but I did talk to her at length about that. Um, and I'm not sure who's working on it now, but there are questions that I'd like to, to have further research on. Um, mm -hmm. There's a discrepancy in how tall she was. Mm -hmm. She's described as one place as five foot two, which even I'm taller than, yes. and in other places, a tall woman. Right. Now, that could be that people are just taller now. Maybe I was tall in the 1800s. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I would love to have a more fleshed out view sure. of what that was. Um, part of the, the issue with knowing uh, deeply more is that the family line ended. Her, her son would have been the one to be the carrier of part of this history. Mm -hmm. And instead, she was the carrier of his history. Mm -hmm. So that changed a little bit. I would love to find out more. I think there's probably some things in the Contraband Association papers that haven't been discovered. Um, and maybe there's a lot to learn about the exhibit at the World's Fair. I've not been able to get very deeply into that, re that research thread, but it's something that I'm very interested in. So there's still a lot of work. Yeah, but Flesner's, uh, her biography was a seminal biography. It will be hard to do. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, are there other questions out there? Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. <laughs>